Okay, thank you very much. So I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak here, and of course for setting up this entire thing. So the work I will report on here is some work which was done together with Mario Stelöv and Konstantin Sarembo, and it appeared on the archive just yesterday. There's also some precursor for the work, done in collaboration with Gordon Semenov and Donovan Young, and there's some work in progress, which also involves my student, Isaac Brug Mortensen. So, the title of my talk is One Point Functions in Defect CFP and Integrability. And um, the integrable system which will appear in this talk is a very simple one, namely the Heisenberg spin chain. So I will start by reviewing the Heisenberg spin chain and its role within ADS CFT. Then I will remind you how certain defect CFTs make their appearance uh, within the ADS CFT setup. And in such uh, defect setups, Certain bulk operators can have one-point functions, and the main purpose of my talk is to explain how one can calculate such one-point functions using the tools or at least the language of integrability. And I will finish with some open problems and the conclusion. Okay, so uh, very much down to earth. The Heisenberg spin chain is a one-dimensional quantum mechanical system. It's a one-dimensional lattice where at each lattice size side lives a spin one half variable. Its Hamiltonian is given by this expression here where the sigmas are the Pauli matrices, or it can be written in terms of permutations where Pn over n plus one is a permutation matrix which permutes the spins at sites n and n plus one. Now to solve the model, we want to determine its eigenvalues and its eigenvectors, and there, are, there exist a strong methods by means of which we can do that because it's an integrable system, which follows from the fact that there exists a tower of higher con charge, conserved charges which commute with each other and with the Hamiltonian. So the first charge is related to the total momentum of the excitation of the spin chain in this way. The second charge is traditionally viewed as the Hamiltonian itself. And then there are higher charges which involve uh, more and more neighbors. Okay, I'm telling you these basic things because it will be of importance for the following. Okay. Um, so first of all, if we choose the sign of the Hamiltonian appropriately, the ground state will be a state with all the spins pointing in the same direction, because that state is killed by one minus the permutation operator. And starting from this state, we can build, using the algebraic beta ansatz, all the excited states. So an excited state, which has m spin clips related uh, compared to this uh, vacuum state, we get formally by acting with some um, creation operators on the vacuum state. These creation operators, they depend on some variables, the rapidities, and in order for us to have an eigenstate, these rapidities should fulfill a set of algebraic equations, which are the beta equations, <coughs> and the m of them. And these variables, the beta roots, they can be viewed as the rapidities of excitations living on the chain, and uh, they are also related to momentum of the excitations in this way here. And I'm interested only in solutions for which the total momentum is equal to zero, which correspond to cyclically invariant states in the spin chain. Okay, so this I will need, and one more basic thing, <coughs> namely that the solutions of the beta equations have an interesting uh, uh, property. Uh, First of all, the beta equations are invariant if you send all the rapidities to minus themselves. And that means that the solutions of the beta equations can be split into paired and unpaired solutions. So uh, let's see what happens if you take a solution and you send the rapidities to minus themselves. Then two things can happen. Either the solution remains the same or it turns into another uh, state, which is also a solution due to the symmetry of the equation. So if the solution is invariant under the sign change of rapidities, then we call it an unpaired solution. And if it changes when we change the rapidities, then we call it a paired solution. Paired solution because there is a partial solution with the opposite value of the rapidities. And uh, what distinguishes these two types of solution is, among other things, that um, for the unpaired solution, the unpaired solution are annihilated by all the odd charges whereas uh, this does not hold for the paired solutions. This will also be of importance for the following. 
Okay, so just a brief reminder of what is the role of the Heisenberg spin chain within the ADS CFT correspondence. So the ADS CFT correspondence comes with a dictionary which relates local gauge invariant operators to spring states and the corresponding conformal dimensions to the energies of the spring states. And when we want to determine the conformal dimensions in the CFT, which is diagonalized the dilatation operator, and under certain simplifying circumstances, the dilatation operator becomes exactly equal to the Heisenberg spin chain Hamiltonian. And the simplifying circumstances are the following. First, we have to take the planar limits. Then we have to restrict ourselves to the one loop level. And thirdly, we have to restrict ourselves to a certain subsector within the full uh, symmetry group of um, n equals 4 super young males. And in this SU2 subsector, uh, the operators can always be written as single trace operators involving two complex fields that I can denote as set as W. And it's clear that such an operator can be mapped onto a spin chain state by identifying each set with a spin up and each W with U with a spin down. This is, of course, trivial. What is less trivial is that the dilatation operator turns into the Hamilton operator of the Heisenberg spin chain, but uh, that's by now an old story, so we're not going to that. Okay, uh, so using this mapping of the dilatation operator onto an integrable spin chain Hamiltonian, one has, in practice, solved the spectral problem. That is a problem of determining all the conformal dimensions to all loop orders and for all sectors. And then the question is, what could the next step be? So, so one possibility would be to move on to the non-planar level, that is, trying to determine non-planar two-point functions. And there has been some work in that direction, not least by the following speaker and myself, but I think the brief conclusion is that the usual tools of integrability, in particular spin chain integrability, does not really work, but there are some one and two loop results in certain subsectors. Another direction of investigation would be to move on to the three-point functions, because after all, we're dealing with a CFT and knowing all the two-point functions and the three-point functions, we should know everything that there is to know about the theory. And uh, in terms of three-point functions, many interesting results have been obtained, and we have heard of the most recent and very impressive ones earlier this week by Basu and Yannick. And uh, now there exists, a, as we heard, a conjecture for an all-loop formula in, in some subsectors of the theory. <laughs> but what I will talk about mainly in this uh, talk uh, is another line of investigation which has not been pursued very much so far, namely the calculation of one-point functions. Of course, in the, in the canonical ads CFT setup, uh, due to conformal invariance, one does not have one-point functions. But uh, in certain setups with defects, uh, bulk operators can get non-managing one-point functions, and uh, my purpose is to calculate these one-point functions. Okay, so let me remind you of, of the defect setup, but then it, how it appears within the ads CFT correspondence. So this is diagram is supposed to illustrate the field theory side. So the overall picture is that we have n equals four super young meals in a bulk four-dimensional space. And in this space, we have a three-dimensional defect, say at set equal to zero. On this defect, there are some defect fields living which interact among themselves and with the fields of n equals four super young meals. But we do not need to know very much about the the full theory, which Lagrangian can be written down explicitly, but the um, details will not be important for the following. What is important is that this, in this setup, which was invented by the Volker, Friedman, or Gould a long time ago, the defect distinguishes two regions of space which have different gauge groups. On one side, the gauge group of the n equals 4 super young is in the SUN minus K, and on the other side is SUN. And the difference in the rank of the gauge group uh, on the two sides is counterbalanced by the fact that on this side here, some of the scalar fields of the super young mills theory have, can have a non-vanishing expectation value. So in any for super young mills, we have six scalar fields, and in the simplest defect setup, uh, only three of them get a non-zero expectation value. And uh, the classical field corresponding to that expectation value could be written in matrix form like this, where just in the upper left-hand corner, there's some non-vanishing k times k matrix. Okay, and uh, my interest will be to calculate one-point functions on this side of the defect, one-point functions of these 
uh, non-vanishing scale of fields to tree level. This is some of the simplest problem you can formulate. And it's clear that it's only operators which are built from these fields which have, have non-vanishing expectation values. Okay. So before I go into the calculation of the expectation values, let me remind you what the dual string theory picture looks like. On the dual string theory side, we have a situation where we have inserted a probe E5 brain in the ADS5 times S5 setup generated by the usual N D3 brain. And the geometry of this D5 brain is ADS4 times S3. And it shares a three-dimensional world with a four-dimensional space where the super Yamis theory lives. And it, this way it constitutes the three-dimensional uh, sub uh, defect in the, in the field theory. And the setup should also be such that um, K D3 brains are dissolved in the D5 brain. So that pictorial you have N minus K D3 brains sticking out on one side and N on the other side. And that's what causes a difference in size of the two K groups. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so now I would like to calculate the non vanishing one point functions on one type of the defect. And what I mean by that is that I will find the classical solution, simplest classical illusion, solution for the scale of fields um, and expand around that. So the classical equation of motion for the scale of fields, one can write it this way here, if we assume that the field just depends on the distance from the defect and that distance I will simply call z. Um, the solution was already found by Constable Myers and Tafjord in 99. And it's not difficult to see that if this expression here for the scalar field is a solution, where in the upper left-hand corner we have uh, some k times k matrices which constitute a k-dimensional representation of SE2. Uh, with this solution also fulfills the NAM equations, which ensures that the maximum amount of supersymmetry as possible is conserved. And of course, now, the operators which have one point functions which are not vanishing are built for the first three fields, which uh, take this form here. And to be able to use integrability, I, of course, have to construct some SU2 subsector. And I do it in this way here, which is the simplest possible one. So Z equals phi 1 plus I phi 4, W equals two phi 2 plus I phi 5. Then it's clear what I have to do to calculate the one point functions. If I just have a single trace operator like that, then I have to replace each z by a generator t1 and each w by a generator t2 and then take the trace. And in the spin chain picture, it corresponds to replacing spin up by t1 and spin down by t2. And I want to find a systematic approach to calculate these one point functions. Uh, to do that, I, um, I want to introduce a defect state or a classical state associated with a defect. And, uh, that state is something which one normally calls a matrix product state. It's a spin chain state which is tensored with some matrix product. <coughs> so it takes this form here. Uh, for each side of the chain, I can have either a spin up or a spin down. If it's a spin up, it's tensored with T1, and if it's a spin down, it's tensored with T2, which of course applies to this recipe here. That I can also write as some defect operator acting on the vacuum. Uh, where the defect operator looks like this. So uh, yeah, the defect operator has to act on to the left on a lot of spins up. So this one here gives me just the spin up coming back and then I tend to with a T1. Again, according to the recipe, this one acting to the left gives me a spin down and then I tend to with T2. And finally, this one here doesn't do anything so I can tend with any K times K matrix. And in particular, I can choose this S to be zero, this T to be T2. And then uh, I, I get this simple expression here. And furthermore, if I take the two-dimensional representation, then I can take T1 to be sigma 3 and T2 to be sigma 1. And then I get something which looks very reminiscent of the algebraic beta ansatz construction. Well, it doesn't really help me <laughs> in calculating the, the one-point functions, but it's just something which can lead one to think that maybe this system is uh, integrable as uh, this in chain uh, spectral problem itself. Okay, uh, but having introduced this uh, defect state here, I can formulate very easily what it is that I want to calculate. Oops. Namely, I want to calculate the overlap 
with that defect state and the beta eigenstate. And I also want to normalize the copy of this so I divide by the norm of the beta eigenstate. Where again, the beta eigenstate is something I get from the vacuum by acting with some creation operators that I get from the algebraic beta ansatz uh, code. Uh, and I want to consider any type of eigenstate, any length of the spin chain, any number of excitations. And the dream scenario that we had when we started this project was that this one point function would be given of in terms of a closed determinant formula valued for any eigenstate, any length, any number of excitations. And our dream was based by the knowledge, on the knowledge that there are certain determinant formulas of that type. For instance, the norm of a beta state can be written as a determinant, which is so-called the dense uh, determinant. Also, the overlap between a beta state and a beta eigenstate can be written as a determinant that's called the Slavnov determinant. So it, uh, this determinant is valid even if one of the states is, is not a beta eigenstate but just a beta state, uh, which means that it can be written like this, but that the rapidities do not necessarily fulfill the beta equation. Uh, finally, there are also some determinant formula for the overlap of a beta eigenstate with a nil state, which is a space state with alternating spins up, down, up, down. Uh, and, and those results were most, most recent. Now, our defect state is not a, a beta eigenstate or beta state, because and if it were, then we would be done. Um, it's also not the nil state, but it's quite closely related to the nil state, as I will explain in a minute. Okay, uh, so first, what can we say on general grounds about this uh, one-point function or, or overlap? Well, first of all, one can easily see that the overlap vanishes unless the length of the chain and the number of excitations are both even. And that's most easy to see if you look at the two-dimensional representation where the generators anti-commute, but it's actually true for any case. Then one can also convince oneself that the overlap vanishes unless the beta eigenstate has total momentum zero. But I'm only interested in total momentum zero because uh, I'm interested in cyclically invariant states in any resource that I am with, where the cyclicity function is trace. But other people could be, like condensed matter physicists, could be interested in, in other types of beta eigenstates. Uh, the fact that the total momentum has to be zero follows from the fact that the defect state has total momentum zero, and that's because uh, it's all its expansion coefficients are traces. So that means that if I sandwich the lattice translation operator, which is related to the total momentum in this way here, in between a beta eigenstate and the defect state, then nothing happens if I act with it to the left, and therefore nothing should happen if I act with it to the right. So therefore only beta eigenstates which have total momentum zero have a known vanishing overlap. Furthermore, the overlap vanishes except if we are considering unpaired states. And that follows from what I told you in the beginning, that the third charge, uh, or the or charges in general, uh, kill the defect state. <coughs> and the fact that all the paired states <coughs> that have a, a value of a third charge, which is different from zero. That means that if we sandwich the third charge between the defect state and the eigenstate, then we get zero if we act to the left. And if we act to the right, then we get some eigenvalue small q3 times the overlap. And if this q3 is different from zero, then the overlap has to vanish. So the overlap has to vanish for, for the paired state. So we can only hope to have something non-vanishing if the rapidities come in pairs. Okay, so, so that were the general results. But now let me move on to some specific results. So here are some specific results that you can obtain by hand. Uh, so the simplest one is, of course, the overlap of the defect state with the vacuum that you just need to take the trace of one generator and you can take a diagonal one and um, it gives you a sum of two theta functions which you can expand for large k in this way here. And actually expanding for large k is, being able to expand for large k is important because it's for large k that we can hope to have a, a comparison with this string theory side. But I will come back to that in a minute. You can also by hand uh, obtain an expression for two excitations. Uh, now I have written here p and minus p instead of u and minus u, but this is because, yeah, 
that I'm actually here using eigenstates as formulated in the coordinate space beta ansatz. In name, it turns out that it's easier to do the concrete calculation using the coordinate space beta ansatz, although this formulation of the fixed state as a measure for state seems to indicate otherwise. But nevertheless, uh, okay, the result looks like this. It's an uh, expression which is valid for any representation and any length of the chain. And uh, yeah, if the representation is of odd rank, then I have to sum over half the integral. I can specialize to the k equals two dimensional representation. Then it looks like this. And uh, I can also expand for large k, and I get this result here. But these results are, of course, very specific, but maybe not so exciting. But I think we have something on the next slide which is more exciting. Namely, we, we found a completely general result valid for any number of excitations and uh, any length uh, of the chain. So the result, uh, we found it for k equals two, sorry. The, the result is valid for the two-dimensional representation, any number of excitations and any length. And it's valid for eigenstates where the rapidities come in pairs, as I explained. And uh, since the rapidities come in pairs of the M of them, we need only M over two variables to describe the state. And the matrices which enter this expression here are therefore of size M over two times M over two. So it's a little bit hard to digest, but the, the basic building block is this matrix K, which depends on the rapidities in this relatively symmetric way here. That then has to be inserted in the expression for G plus minus, which is are the matrices which appear here in the final expression. Okay, so, so it's something which is valid for the two-dimensional representation. And uh, what do we build this formula on? Well, we build it on explicit computation using Mathematica, up to inc including eight excitations and up to the spin chains of length approximately 20. Uh, but that's not all. We actually have a proof of the formula in the case where m is equal to L over two. That is where the number of excitations is half the, the length of the chain. And uh, it then it turns out that in that case, uh, we found that after normalizing everything properly, our overlap turned out to be proportional to the overlap of the beta eigenstate with the nil state, where the nil state is the ground state of the antiferromagnetic spin chain, which is this chain which has alternating spins up, down, up, down, and so on. Um, now, our formula is actually true also if m is not equal to L over two. Um, um, but our state, of course, in for general m, our state is of, can of course not be equal to the nil state. And also for exactly for m equal to L over two, it's also not equal to the nil state. But in this case here, it's closely related to the nil state. It's cohomologically equivalent to the nil state, we can show. I mean, it can be written as some constant times a nil state got some lowering operator acting on another state. And since beta eigenstates are highest weight states, then this part here does not contribute to the overlap. And therefore, we have a proof of our determinant formula in the case where m is equal to L over two, but only in that case. Okay, now let me flash to you a formula which is not in our paper, but which we believe is true, but needs some more checks. It th seems that the we can find a solution for any representation. And it seems to factorize into the result for the two-dimensional representation, and then a prefactor, which depends, of course, on k and also on all the rapidities. And what is particularly interesting about having this expression is that we can take the limit k going to infinity, which is a, a limit which is of interest to string theory, because there exists a BMN-like scaling for this model. If you send the soft coming to infinity, also the size of the representation to infinity, but you keep this ratio here finite and small. Then you can treat the gauge theory perturbatively and you can do semi-classical uh, semi -classical analysis on the string theory side and you can compare. And uh, this comparison has been done to leading order in lambda over k squared for chiral primaries, which are operators which are protected in the original theory, but of course not in, in the defect theory. And in this setup that I've been speaking about with the V5 brain, this comparison was done by Nagasaki and Yamaguchi in 2012. And uh, 
the girl was seven on a young. We did it uh, for some other pro brain setups later. Um, but of course, now we have this formula for non protected states, and we should be able to make other comparisons, for instance, comparisons involving spinning strings and non protected operators. And uh, that leads me to my list of open questions. So, of course, it would be nice to have a full proof of the determinant formula that we found for m equals uh, L over 2. It would be nice to have it also for m different from L over 2. Secondly, it would be nice to have a proof of the general determinant formula valid for any sizable representation. And we're working on that. Another thing we're working on is to find the thermodynamical limit, the limit where we send the length of the chain and the number of excitations <coughs> to infinity, but keep the ratios finite. Because this is what you need if you want to look at spinning strings on the string theory side. It is not completely trivial, but uh, we hope to have some progress on that at some point. But uh, there are so many other things what to think of doing. One can look at one point functions at higher loops and for other sectors in the defect CFT. And one can look at other defect setups corresponding to other pro brain setups in the string theory, such as D3D7 instead of D3D5. And of course, very importantly, one could dream of having more detailed comparisons with string theory involving non protected operators and uh, spinning strings. And that leads me to my conclusion. So it's very short. We have found for the two dimensional representation and possibly for any representation a close expression of determinant form, the thing we were dreaming of. Um, and for this, the tools of integrability again came in handy, but uh, many interesting open questions still remain. Thank you. Uh, how difficult is it to calculate these things in uh, using the field theory for formalism instead of going into integrability? Well, we are doing the field theory formalism to calculate the three point, the, the three, three level one point functions. We just have to insert the value of the classical field in these various traces. But since the good conformal operators are com complicated linear combinations of many traces, the integrability methods uh, are really what you need to use. <laughs>